Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Harriet Hamasi, University Librarian at Brown. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Omer Bartov uh, tonight, who will talk about his most recent book. When was it published? It's, it's not publi it's published yet. No, it will be published in so December. aren't we lucky? Yeah. <laughs> um, just a few words about Omer. Mo many of you may know him already. Um, but you, how long have you been at Brown? 17 years. 17 years. And Omer is a uh, professor of European history and a professor of German studies. And you hold a chair, uh, the John P. Birkeland Distinguished uh, Professor. Um, his scholarly work has uh, focused on Nazism and also the Jews. And he uh, has been working on this book. How long did you work on it? That's always an interesting <laughs> question. A decade. A decade, right. <coughs> So one of the things that I'm very pleased about uh, this uh, kind of small series that we've put together this year, we have maybe about five speakers in total uh, who are talking about the Holocaust uh, history and aftermath. And when I uh, touched base with you early in the fall and asked if you would speak, um, Omar was very gracious in saying that, I mean, this is really a lot about um, the work of your your entire uh, history of scholarship, isn't it? And I think the, the great thing is that part of what you are speaking about, uh, issues of racism and violence, which uh, were present in the 1940s in Europe, are still haunting us today. Maybe they will always haunt us, I don't know, and you may speak to that. But it is part of the human condition, the human relationships that we have. But I think it's so uh, appropriate that we continue to have this discussion and to examine what we have learned from history, what we have at least have observed in history, whether we've actually learned uh, to do better or to do differently. But thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm, I, I'll be talking about um, a book that I completed, as you heard, after a decade. In fact, in some ways, I've been working on it for much longer, as I will explain. Uh, it hopefully will come out uh, in December. Um, I still have to see the copy edits and the whole painful process of production, but I'm very happy to be at this point. Uh, the book would have been called What You See Here, which is the title of the lecture, but in fact, uh, this is the title of the book now. So it's been retitled. Uh, so it's Anatomy of a Genocide, the Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach. Um, the photo you see was taken uh, in Buchach, in the Jewish cemetery, um, right after the liberation. Uh, these are the survivors. Uh, there were 8,000 people there, 8,000 Jews before the war, and that's the people who survived. I talked with some of them, and they put up a little monument uh, in the Jewish cemetery where um, there was one of the mass graves. This was one of the killing sites in the town. Uh, that uh, <coughs> monument does not exist anymore. Uh, apparently the Soviets did away with it uh, shortly thereafter. We don't know exactly what happened to it. Um, but the book began much earlier than that. Um, the reason that I called it The Voice of Your Brother's Blood uh, is really because of my own um, uh, mother tongue, Hebrew, and that the term in Hebrew, in many ways, is more evocative than in English, called me'achicha. It's very short. It comes in Genesis. And in free translation, in my own translation, it comes, of course, uh, uh, from the following verse in Genesis. And God said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Uh, and as I thought about uh, this book, as I was working on, the, on it, I understood that the, the book is really about the voices of the people of a place that existed 
as a multi-ethnic entity for about four <coughs> centuries, uh, and then was eradicated as such, and does not exist anymore, uh, um, or rather exists only in memory and recollection and testimonies, uh, but when you go there, uh, the place is there, the site is there, uh, but the people who live there don't actually remember <coughs> what it was, uh, and the people who survived that and lived thereafter were living elsewhere and not there. Uh, I started uh, the book with a question. Um, I'll go back to that in a moment. Um, I, st I started the book with a question that I posed to myself uh, in the mid-90s, uh, or early 90s, really. Uh, that was the fall of communism. Um, the, the world was supposed to be a much better place. Uh, history had come to an end, and everything would have been better, so we read. And right after that, uh, we had the uh, genocide in Bosnia, followed by the genocide in Rwanda in 92 and 94. Uh, and I started thinking about what is the relationship between those genocides, which were very personal, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you may remember in Rwanda, about 800,000 people were butchered in about 10 weeks. It's the fastest genocide in history, mostly with machetes and fire uh, in, in villages by their own neighbors. Uh, often their own priests called them to the churches where they were butchered. Um, and I asked myself, what is the relationship between what we saw in the 1990s and what um, we knew or thought we knew about the Holocaust? And we had a certain view of the Holocaust, I think I was complicit in that, as uh, an event, I even used the term in a, title, in a subtitle of a book, as industrial killing. So the Holocaust was this thing where Jews were gathered, say, in Grunewald in Berlin, uh, marched down the street, the neighbors looked uh, through the windows and didn't come out, they were taken to the train station, uh, put on a train and, and disappeared. They went to the east. Uh, when they arrived in the east, as we sort of imagined it, some went to ghettos and others went directly to be shot or, or into extermination camps. Um, and that's true. And about half of the Jews in the Holocaust were killed uh, in extermination camps, in gassing facilities. Uh, and the Germans uh, tried, um, partly because of the experiences of one-on-one -on -one killing, to create a mechanism of detaching uh, the perpetrators from the, from the victims. Uh, part of it was a matter of ideology, of dehumanizing the victim, so that you wouldn't think of them anymore as human beings. It's much easier to, pe to kill cockroaches, as they were called in Rwanda, or, or Untermenschen, as they were called in uh, Nazi language. Uh, and secondly, to create a mechanism that facilitates that. Uh, those of you who remember uh, a, a book by uh, Gita Sereni, <coughs> Into That Darkness, uh, interviews that she conducted with uh, Franz Stangl, who was the commandant of Sobibor in Treblinka, who was probably uh, directed the killing of about a million and a half people. Uh, he talked about this process that he saw the Jews as lemmings. They would come out of the train and run through this uh, schlauch, as they called it, through this hose. Uh, naked, and then disappear in the gas chambers. He never saw them as human beings. So that was uh, a system that was perfected, if you like, of mass industrial killing without any contact with the victims. Um, and I remember I went on uh, uh, touring some uh, seminars in Germany uh, to see how the Holocaust was being taught in Germany. Uh, and there were... Uh, uh, very good students there, they read a lot of the literature, they m mostly the German language literature. They were interested in, in the perpetrators, they were interested in their own uh, ancestors, so to speak. Um, and um, they, they studied the Holocaust through this prism, through this prism of how you organize a genocide. And I started thinking, but there was much more than that. There was not just this kind of killing. What happened to the other half? How does genocide occur when you actually have to come to a family, to a child, to a mother with children, and shoot them in the head? How does that happen 
on the one-to-one -one level in which about half of the victims actually died. So I became interested in the dynamic of the encounter, the encounter that the Nazis tried to prevent, but that in fact happened in hundreds of thousands of cases between the perpetrator and the victim. And I thought, how do you how do, you do that? Um, and in order to uh, um, try to recreate that, I went back, as many of us do at a certain age, to uh, my dissertation. Uh, when I wrote my dissertation, I did a kind of local study. But the local study I did was of three German army divisions. And I studied all the people who were in these divisions to see how they behaved on the Eastern Front. And I won't go into all the details of that, but it was a, a kind of local history of what was called in Germany ein Blick von unten, a history from below, a view from below of history. And I thought, well, if you try to do it for the Holocaust, or for any genocide for that matter, and you want to understand the encounter, the best way to do that is to choose a certain location and see exactly what happened in that location. How did genocide occur there? What was the encounter between the perpetrators and the victims at that place? So I had to choose a place. And then uh, thinking of a place, I thought, well, I'll choose some town in Eastern Europe uh, because such killings happened in Eastern Europe. It didn't happen in the West. In the <coughs> West, as I said, in Berlin or in Paris, uh, people were collected and put on trains and sent elsewhere. But I wanted a place where much of the killing happened right there on the ground. So I chose a place for two reasons. Uh, I chose the town of Buchach. Uh, I knew the name Buchach from my childhood. Uh, most of you have never heard of Buchach, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but most people in Israel have heard uh, the name of Buchach. And the reason is that Buchach is a town from which uh, an, a very famous Hebrew language author came. Uh, his name is Shmuel Yosef Agnon. Agnon. And Agnon uh, happens to be the only Hebrew language author to have received the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1966. Um, and um, uh, much of what he wrote, although he left when he was 21 in 1907, much of what he wrote was about Buchach. Buchach as his hometown, and Buchach as a kind of representative of East European Galician, Podolian Jewry. Uh, so it represented a universe that he came from, that he wrote about before the Holocaust and then also after. So I thought that that would be interesting because, of course, what he wrote was only about Buchach as a Jewish town. Uh, his, his most important book on Buchach came out only after his death. It's a posthumous book. It's called The City Hall, Irum Loire. It's a vast tome, it's 750 pages in Hebrew and very small print. In English, it would be about 1,500 pages. And it's an extraordinary book that many people, even in Israel, don't know well. But there was another reason that I chose that town, and that is that my mother also came from that town. Oh, so that's, that's the person you're looking at when she was young. And I thought, well, the best way to start this project is to ask my mother about her hometown. Now, she left this town in 1935 when she was 11 with her parents and her two brothers. Uh, they went to Palestine, um, and um, the rest of the family, save for two uncles, one brother from one side and one brother from the other side, uh, disappeared, were murdered. Uh, after all these years of research later, I still don't know how my own family members were killed, but they, they were all murdered there. And so in 1995, so you can see that this book actually took much more than uh, a decade in, in conception, I interviewed my mother. And I asked her, uh, I said, Ima, tell me about your childhood. And I had a little tape recorder. At the time, we still had tape recorders. And I pressed the button, and she talked for 90 minutes. Uh, I'd never asked her about her childhood before. And, and three years later, I didn't know that at the time, she, she, she passed away. Uh, but she had the story to tell me. I just had to ask. So she spoke for 90 minutes, and she talked about her town, the town of her childhood. Um, and that started me on this journey. Uh, we were supposed to go there together. Uh, we didn't uh, end up going, and then she became sick, and I went there for the first time only in 2003. And when I came there, 
for reasons that you may understand, I was not so sorry that I didn't go with her because it did not resemble what she remembered, which was partly nostalgic and partly because the place had changed so much. So from there, I started studying this town. And as I started studying Buchach, I thought it would be a project of a, a year or two because how much information can you find about a little East European town? What, what is there left? Uh, I, first of all, I discovered that, in fact, <coughs> there were documents in nine different countries, uh, in nine different languages. Uh, I have a, a, a room full of documents. I was swimming in these documents for years and all these different languages. Um, so there was a lot of material. But what I found was that, in fact, my initial idea of uh, examining the encounter between the victims and the perpetrators when you start studying that, you realize that's an insufficient question. It was not simply an encounter between perpetrators and victims, because people lived in that town. And it was not, as Agnon had, had described it, only a Jewish town. For him, it was a Jewish town. And that's actually what the Jews call the shtetl. It's a part of the, it's a figment of the Jewish imagination. There were no shtetls in which there were only Jews. There were all towns in which there were others as well so-called Goyim, Gentiles. That town had Poles and Ukrainians. Uh, the number of Ukrainians in the town itself was smaller, was the smallest, but the countryside was mostly Ukrainian, with also uh, a fair number of Polish uh, villagers. Uh, and the town itself uh, had a large number of Jews, a large number of to Poles, and then a smaller number of Ukrainians. And then I got caught up in the... Uh, um, what, what, what Mark Bloch, uh, the French historian, called the, um, the myth of origins, or the cult of origins. I decided that in order to understand <coughs> what actually happened in that town during the German occupation, one had to understand how these people had lived side by side before. Why did they behave as they did? The Germans came there from nowhere. The Germans came from Germany, came to the town. They had a task to undertake, and, and they did it very efficiently. But the, the rest of the people, the Jews, Ukrainians, and Poles, had been living there together for 400 years, side by side. And so this project became something quite different. It became actually an attempt to reconstruct, first of all, coexistence. Inter-ethnic, it wasn't ever multicultural, but it was inter-ethnic, multi-ethnic. So inter-ethnic relations between Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians for centuries of living together. The Ukrainians were not called Ukrainians, that's a whole other story, uh, but eventually the people came to be called Ruthenians and then U Ukrainians, the peasants, so to speak, and the Poles. And the Jews were always co called uh, Jews there since they started coming there in the 1500s. Uh, how they lived together over time. And when was it that relations started uh, changing between these groups? When was it that something occurred that facilitated the transformation of an inter-ethnic town, of a town of coexistence, into a community of genocide? Into one in which not only the Germans came and killed the Jews, but that, in fact, everyone was involved in this undertaking of cleansing the town, cleansing it of its Jews, and, in fact, <coughs> cleansing it of its Poles. So that by the end of this process, by 1947, two years after the war ends, uh, this place becomes purely, homogeneously uh, Ukrainian. So. I want to take you, I, I, I don't want to talk for, for a huge amount of time because I'm sure there's a, a lot of questions. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll first give you a sort of idea of how uh, I uh, structure the book uh, and then I'll go through some uh, elements of that. So um, the, the first chapter that I, that I talk about is um, the period between 1848 uh, and 1914. Uh, and that's the period of the growth of nationalism uh, in that region. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, the second chapter, I talk about World War I. Uh, World War I is a moment of um, mm -hmm. massive violence there that in that area lasts much longer. It goes on until 1921, <coughs> and I'll say a few words about that uh, in a moment. The third chapter is the interwar period. Uh, I'll explain a bit more in a moment. The interwar period is uh, uh, Buczacz and the whole region is under Polish rule. Um, before that, it was uh, under Habsburg, under Austrian imperial rule. Uh, then I speak about uh, the Soviet occupation of this town. Between 1939 and 1941, this area is under Soviet rule. That's part of the Hitler uh, Stalin Pact, the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact. Uh, and then the last three chapters deal with the actual events from 1941 to 1944 47, depending on which group, which is divided into the establishment of German rule, what I call the daily life of genocide, which is the Jewish experience of the Holocaust, mostly through testimonies, individual testimonies. And finally, what I call neighbors, which is really about the experience of Poles and Ukrainians uh, in that area. And that ex extends into 1947 because uh, the fighting between Poles and Ukrainians uh, continues after the liberation of that area, at least liberation as the Jews see it in uh, 1944. It's not seen as liberation by um, most Ukrainians at the time. So that's the structure of it. Now, I just want to give you uh, uh, some ideas. So in, in some ways, this book was dedicated to the women in my family. So my, my grandmother, who came from Buchach, uh, my mother was born there, and my sister, who was obviously like me already born in Israel. Uh, just to locate the place itself, uh, this is a map from uh, uh, the period of the Habsburg Empire. It's from the late 19th century. Uh, this area is Galicia. Uh, it's, it's eastern Galicia. And uh, uh, the town of Buchach is here. So if you want to locate it, uh, any of you who know about Lemberg, or Lvov, Viv, Viv, Lvov, uh, it's here. So Buchach is on the southeastern edge of eastern Galicia. So it's in the east of the east. Uh, it's uh, uh, a very distant place. It's located next to uh, another town called Chotkov that I'll uh, say more, more about later. Uh, Chotkov was also known as a Hasidic town, uh, but that's also the town where under German rule the um, uh, security police had its headquarters. Uh, and the security police then uh, was in charge of uh, uh, exterminating the Jews in this area under its control. Uh, if you look at it now, uh, nowadays, uh, under uh, this area is now in uh, Ukraine, and you can see um, that uh, Ternopil is here, Tarnopol, Ivano Frankivsk, which used to be Stanislavov or Stanislavov, and Buchach is in between here, uh, someplace here. So it's now in uh, Ukraine, and one of the main landmarks in this area are the Carpathian Mountains, uh, which really divide uh, this area of Eastern Europe with the opening plains that then go all the way to the Dnieper. So um, we'll start with this. Um, um, the book actually, in its original conception, because I was very ambitious, uh, starts in 1260, uh, which is the th first document <laughs> that we have of Buchach. And I had an idea of writing a biography of the town from the very beginning. That made it into a really long book. Uh, my, my publisher was a little um, um, disgruntled uh, with the length of it. So uh, I, I, I um, uh, wrote two chapters, two initial chapters which covered the medieval period and then the, the wars of the 17th century in particular and the 18th century uh, and made them into a few paragraphs that begin this chapter. So <laughs> I was very sad to do that, but uh, I can understand the reasons for it. Uh, the book will still be about 450 pages long, so it's not going to be a little book. Uh, it would have been too long. Uh, so I really start in 1848, and what is interesting for me about uh, this period, 1848 to 1914, 
is that uh, this is a period in which uh, many possibilities opened up for people who had been living in this uh, little, what my mother used to call Eckwelt, the corner of the world, so, so, sort of uh, in nowhere in particular, a hole in the wall. And suddenly they could go, they could get an education, they could leave this place and go to the world. But it's also the period of nationalism. Nationalism begins first among Poles in this area. Uh, there is a growing uh, Ukrainian national movement, and uh, this area, Galicia, is considered to be the, the sort of birthplace of Ukrainian nationalism, uh, and belatedly also Jewish nationalism, and particularly in this area, Zionism, uh, toward the end of the 19th century. Uh, and you can see the the growth of these uh, three national movements. Part of what these national movements do, which is what all national movements do, is they rewrite the past. They tell histories about themselves. And these histories are their own narratives of what had happened and why they're there, where they came from, and what their relationship is to the place in which they are. Uh, the narratives were, were very different, obviously. Uh, and they were not necessarily um, in, in, in tension with each other because each group told itself its own stories. And these stories were fine and, uh, until there was some tension, until there was some violence. And then the stories became contradictory stories, conflicting stories. And what we see in the, in the course of this period into the late 19th century and early 20th century is the tensions rising. So for the Poles, this area, including very much Buchach, was an area to which they brought uh, order and civilization. This was the Wild East, right? Uh, it stretched all the way f much further than there. It stretched uh, all the way to Kiev and, and beyond. Uh, but in this area, in the Polish stories about Buchach in that area, uh, they had brought civilization. And towns like Buchach were the fortresses of Polish culture against Eastern barbarism. And this barbarism were the Ottomans, uh, barbarism were the Tatars, and barbarism were the Cossacks, although the Cossacks were also serving uh, under Polish rule and were also being, being hired by the Poles to protect their uh, fortresses. Um, and, and that story that was being uh, written then, such as uh, Sienkiewicz's famous book, uh, um, uh, by, by fire and sword, Ognia uh, uh, mi which I read as a kid uh, in Hebrew translation. Um, uh, these were stories of um, a little bit like what you would have read about the Wild West. Uh, that is, bringing civilization to that place. And in fact, Sienkiewicz, who couldn't go to the East and wanted to see what the Wild East in the 17th century, about which he wrote, looked like, uh, went to America in 1860 to see what the Wild East would have looked like in the Wild West. Uh, this was his uh, experience. Um, so this was the Polish story, and in many ways that story still survives. That is, there is a, still a Polish nostalgia for the Kresse, for the Polish borderlands, and there are remnants of that until today. There are churches, some have been renovated now, some are ruins, uh, there are cemeteries, uh, there are manor houses, uh, which are remnants of Polish rule in that area. For Ukrainians, as Ukrainian nationalism developed, um, the Poles were colonizers. They colonized the indigenous population uh, who were the Ukrainians. Not that they were called Ukrainians, but they were the local population. Uh, in this area, they were recognized as being Greek Catholic. So much of the identity had to do with the, um, with the religion. If you went further east, of course, it was Orthodox. Um, so for them, the Poles were the colonizers. The Poles were those who subjected them, uh, who, who made them into serfs. Uh, if you think about uh, the, the, the constitutive uh, event, which is also what Sienkiewicz wrote, wrote about, it's the Khmelnytsky uprising. It's 1648, the uprising of the Cossacks. Uh, the Ukrainians saw that it, later on in the 19th century as they're rewriting it as a war of liberation. Uh, they were rising up against their oppressors. Uh, the Poles saw that as the rise of the Wild East, which was destroying all the civilization that they had built. Now, the Jews, of course, re re remember that uh, Khmelnytsky for, for Jews 
was a cry about pogroms. When you said Khmelnytsky, you meant pogroms. You meant uh, this was the moment at which Jewish civilization in Ukraine was destroyed, was eradicated. Um, so what was the position of Jews in this uh, competition between Poles and Ukrainians? There was, as I said, a, um, um, a growth of Jewish nationalism. But that Jewish nationalism placed its own affinity to land elsewhere. It wasn't there. Uh, for, for Zionists, uh, the land that was theirs was in the land of Israel. And so by 1914, in many ways, you have uh, three groups, two which are competing over the same space and arguing that it, it is theirs by right, by historical right, by heritage. And the Jews who although they did argue, and Agnon wrote about that, that they had created the cities, that they had created uh, commerce, that they had brought culture to this place, never made a claim for it being theirs. They either sought to uh, assimilate into, at the time, mostly Ukra um, Polish uh, culture, or they became Zionists. And they, obviously, they could become socialists too. I won't go into all that story. Uh, so, um, I tell this story through a number of really interesting characters that uh, chose different paths and how, uh, in a sense, they represent these different choices that existed at the time. So, the choices that opened up uh, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, you can see them closing down by 1914. One has to remember, though, that although we have often this image that this was the Wild East and, ev and everybody was very violent and there was killings all the time, that's simply not true. So from the end of the 17th century uh, until World War I, in this area, there's very little violence. Uh, the rhetoric in the latter part of the 19th century uh, becomes more and more violent, but there's very little actual physical violence. All that changes dramatically, of course, in World War I, uh, I, I, I didn't actually explain what this uh, photo is. So uh, this re represents something that was happening at the time. This photo was taken in Buchach. This is the main square in, in uh, Buchach, the Rinek, the, the, the marketplace. Uh, one of the people here, uh, I think it's this one, is Agnon. Uh, as a very young man. Uh, the picture was taken in 1907, so he was 19. He left in 1909, he was 21. Um, but this was an election meeting in 1907 around the uh, very famous elections that I'm sure all of you heard of 1907, uh, in which uh, the, the Jewish parties um, made a coalition with the Ukrainians against the Poles. Uh, and by then, already, politics is identified very much according to ethnic lines. Right? Uh, which would not have been the case only 50 years earlier. Um, um, there, there are all kind of interesting people here. There's a man called Nathan Birnbaum, which, who was very known in politics at the time, but we won't go into that. Um, World War I, we think of World War I as a war, um, I, I think most of us, me included, until a few years ago, when we think of World War I, we think of the Western Front, uh, uh, we think of trench warfare, uh, of the massive killing, of the, of the Battle on the Somme, of Verdun, of, of all of that. Uh, and most of us know very little about the war in the East. The war in the East was very different, but it was extremely bloody. There was much more movement, uh, but it was both extremely bloody and it was a war in which um, uh, people often didn't fight for the reasons that we would think. So uh, in, in the case of Galicia, where you have the Austrians and the Germans fighting the Russians, uh, the people who are in fighting for the Austrians, uh, there are uh, many different units. There are Czech units, there are Hungarian units. Uh, there are also Polish and Ukrainian. Uh, the Poles are not fighting for the empire. They're fighting for an independent Poland. The Ukrainians are not fighting for the empire. They're fighting for an independent Ukraine. Uh, Probably the Jews are fighting for the empire because they, by, the, by that time, they're more or less the only people who can be identified as Kaiser Troy, as loyal to the Kaiser. 
because the expectation is that the alternative is going to be not very good. Uh, it's going to be nation states. And as I try to say, which nation state will they belong to? They don't have a natural nation state in that area. So the war there is very bloody, and I was astounded to see how much destruction there was in, in Buchach itself. Uh, Buchach is ruled twice by the Russians. It's uh, conquered by the Russians uh, at the beginning of the war. They rule it for over a year, they <coughs> occupy it, then they're pushed out, and then they come back. Uh, and the, the violence in this town, and particularly uh, anti-Jewish violence, is, is extraordinary. There, there are several accounts. There's a famous account, as you may know, by uh, Ansky, uh, the author who wrote the D-book. If you know the, <coughs> the, the play, the D-book, there's a movie from the 1930s in Yiddish. Uh, he toured this area and wrote about it, but there's some specific accounts, including one by him, of Buchach under Russian occupation or right after it was liberated from Russian occupation. There, there's massive killing there, there's depo deportations and so forth. Once the war is over, it immediately after that, uh, there's a war between Ukrainian and Polish nationalists. That is, Poland becomes independent. <coughs> Poland wants to uh, keep this area that it sees as its, as its rightful legacy. And uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalists uh, want to create and do create a, a Western Ukrainian republic, uh, which uh, shortly thereafter is occupied by the Poles. Uh, as the Poles occupy that, this area is invaded by the Red Army. And, and you may remember the Red Army charges all the way to the Vistula. Uh, it almost captures Warsaw. Then the Poles have their own miracle on the Vistula, uh, which is very much like the miracle on the Marne. That's the association with 1914. Uh, and they're they pushed back. And so Poland is created in an area that includes Eastern Galicia. But Eastern Galicia is an area in which the majority population is Ukrainian. So um, um, the, the Ukrainians are about 60% of the population in Eastern Galicia. Uh, then there's a large Polish minority, and there is a relatively large, over 10%, um, Jewish population. Uh, and then the 1930s are a period uh, in which you see how the violence of World War I, the disappointment and disillusionment of what had happened um, with the loss of uh, Ukrainian nationhood, um, the, the, the oppression, uh, repressive policies by the Polish government of uh, Ukrainian nationalists create an increasing um, simmering uh, violence in that area. In 1930, there's an attempt by Ukrainian nationalists to respond to the refusal of the Polish government to meet its agreement to grant autonomy to Ukrainians in Galicia. Uh, there's a campaign of burning down uh, Ukrainian properties. The Polish government responds with pacification policies, which are very brutal. Uh, people are killed, arrested, beaten up. Uh, libraries of Ukrainian nationalists are burned down. Um, 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 so it is a kind of uh, policy of increasing repression that results in the growth of the Ukrainian underground. Uh, and the Ukrainian underground, the OUN, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, uh, is a particularly radical movement. Uh, and it creates an ideology, it's founded in 1929, and becomes increasingly popular <coughs> through the 1930s. It's illegal, of course. Uh, and the ideology that it forges is the need to create a Pole-free and Jew-free Ukraine. Um, and it, it's very strongly influenced by other fascist ideologies. Uh, ma many scholars argue it is a fascist organization. Obviously, most Ukrainian historians <coughs> agree. But whatever it is, fascist or not, it is a radical, in, 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 uh, integral nationalist organization. Um, the Polish government also increases from 1935 in particular uh, with the death of the uh, dictator in Poland, Piłsudski, uh, becomes increasingly anti-Semitic. So there's a whole series of anti-Semitic 
uh, uh, laws and regulations um, and, um, uh, and increasing poverty within the Jewish community and Jews try to leave. But obviously it becomes increasingly difficult to leave that area. My mother, or rather my grandfather, uh, was lucky to uh, be able to receive a certificate of immigration to Palestine uh, at, the age, at the ripe age of 35, uh, which was the limit for getting a certificate. Uh, and he sort of cheated his way through getting that certificate uh, and took my mother and her brothers and my grandmother to Palestine, but most people couldn't get out uh, and were basically trapped in that area. Um, now, the, the next period is, is crucial because, as you remember, in 1939, what really enables Hitler to begin uh, World War II uh, is the agreement between Nazi Germany and uh, Stalinist Russia. And in that agreement, uh, Eastern Europe is divided between the two powers. Uh, and the eastern part of Poland is given to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union rules that area, including uh, obviously Galicia and Buczaj, for two years. Uh, those two years, uh, that was not the original intention by the Soviets, but that's the result, in many ways sets up uh, the killings that happen right after the Germans march in. Because the Soviets enact their own policies of uh, uh, dealing with different nationalities. Uh, they begin with the policy of deportations of uh, Polish elites, of the Polish aristocracy, Polish political leaders, uh, um, and uh, um, that is really decapitating uh, the Polish population. This is followed by uh, waves of deportations of Jews. Uh, Jews are deported either for, for political reasons, particularly Zionists, so those who are politically nationalists, uh, or for social reasons, because they are of the wrong social class. Uh, and toward the end of Soviet rule, uh, there is increasing repression of Ukrainian nationalists. And thousands of Ukrainian uh, uh, nationalist activists are in prison. Um, and as the uh, German army invades uh, the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, uh, the uh, Soviets, the Soviet secret police, has a choice of either taking these political prisoners with it as it escapes to the east or killing them. Uh, it generally chooses to kill them. And so they uh, execute in the prisons uh, thousands of uh, mostly not only Ukrainian uh, political activists, the Poles and Jews there as well, but the majority are Ukrainian. And at that point, the Germans move in. So what happens is that in this invasion of this area by the Red Army, uh, it comes into an area in which already a great deal of blood has been shed and, and a great deal of mutual resentment has been created between the different groups. Um, the uh, uh, argument of the, uh, of the German military and the SS and the general pro propaganda of the Germans as they come in is that the killings of the Ukrainians were performed by uh, Judeo-Bolsheviks. Uh, that is, that the Jews are guilty of that because the Bolsheviks are nowhere to be found. They've, they've already gone east. Uh, and that sets loose a wave of pogroms, some of them even before the Germans show up, and some of them while the Germans are there, uh, some under German uh, view, and some uh, also done, carried out by German units. Increasingly, as the Einsatzgruppen, the German killing squads, um, follow the combat units of the Wehrmacht. So this first wave of killings uh, occurs in many towns. There's some of it in Buchach, but not much. Uh, in Lemberg, there's a great deal, in a, a number of other towns in the region, uh, but not so much in Buchas. There is local violence, uh, but it's not extensive. But from that point on, the Germans create their own system, and that system uh, of um, uh, resolving the Jewish question is based on a number of uh, institutions. They bring in uh, the security police, 
The security police in that area is based in that town I showed you near Bucha, Chinchotkov. It's made up of between 20 and 30 uh, Germans or ethnic Germans. They're not all German, some are Poles, uh, some are Czechs, but they're ethnic German. Um, so there may be uh, 20 uh, Reichsdeutsche, Germans from the Reich itself. Uh, those individuals uh, kill about 60,000 Jews in the area under their control, uh, mostly in about 18 months, from the fall, summer fall of 1942 to the summer of 1943. Uh, and obviously they cannot do all of that alone. Uh, so in order to accomplish this task, this extremely rapid mass killing, uh, they create two other uh, um, bodies. One is they recruit uh, Ukrainian nationalists who had formed their own militias as the Soviets were leaving uh, and the Germans were coming, and they transform these militias into police forces. Uh, some of them are battalions, police battalions. That, uh, there's a police battalion right next to this small uh, German security police unit or local police in the different towns. Uh, many of the people who serve in these units uh, were uh, nationalist activists in the 1930s. Uh, I have many names of people that I know already from Polish police files from the 1930s who then serve in the siege, in the, in the militia, and later in the, in the Schutzmannschaften, in the German-created um, auxiliary battalions. Uh, secondly, they organize the Jews. They create in Buchach and many other places, of course, they create a Judenrat, a Jewish council, and they create a Jewish police, an Ordnungsdienst. Uh, and they activate these organizations in a process of rounding up and killing Jews. Um, what is interesting and what I try to reconstruct in this chapter is that for Germans who are engaged in this killing, uh, life during that period is very pleasant. Uh, they, I have many pictures that I won't show you here now, but uh, um, they, they live comfortably in um, uh, homes that they took over. They have very nice furniture. They have cars, they have servants, they bring their families, they bring their wives, they bring their children, they bring their parents. Um, they go hiking, they go skiing, uh, and in between, uh, every once in a while, if you live in Buchach, every once in a while, a truck with people from the uh, security police in Chotkov shows up in the morning. Uh, the local police is organized, including the Jewish police. They round up as many Jews as they can find, and they take them to one of two sites, the two hills, uh, and they shoot them there. Um, in very large numbers, hundreds, in some cases thousands, uh, over a day or two. Uh, and then they go away, and then people resume their lives until they come back. Uh, now, what is also important to understand is that there are these people who come from Chotkov, and they don't really know the people in Buchach, but there are policemen in the town of Buchach who live there, and who know the Jewish population. They know them by name. They interact with them. And they're not only policemen. In a town like Buchach, there was a railroad tunnel and a bridge. They were blown up by the Soviets as they retreated. They have to be rebuilt. They bring in a construction company. The construction company comes with its own engineers. The engineers come with their families because they're going to spend a long time there. So you have an entire social entity there. They have Jewish maids. They have cleaners. They, they have a dentist. They, they, they have a whole apparatus set up, and they know these people by name. And then they see through their windows how these people are led out, sometimes right on the street under their window and shot. Moreover, uh, some of them, particularly some of the young men, like the engineers, the foremen, and so forth, who have no business with the killing, they are doing their own job, are curious about it. So they go and they look. Uh, they, they describe the mass killing sites. Um, and some of them uh, also carry guns because for, for security, so they participate. So what you find is that this 
local genocide is a case in which everybody in one way or another is participating. Uh, when you hear testimonies of these engineers that were given, say, 15 years later, they said, I happen to have been on an errand when the action began. And when you hear the fifth or seventh person saying I was on an errand, you ask yourself, how come they were all on an errand? <laughs> so obviously they were not on an errand. They knew there was an action and they went to see either because they were curious or, as some of them admit, because there was actually uh, property to be had. Right? Because these people were taken out of their homes. So, um, quickly to wrap up, in the chapter after that, uh, I talk about the same events, but from the point of view of the Jews. Um, I have about 250 different voices of Jews who survived in one way or another. Uh, residents of Buchach itself who survived, there, there were only less than 100, but there were many who passed through Buchach and also tell about uh, what happened there. Um, and what interested me most in this chapter was in many ways how Jews talk about their interaction with others, with Poles, Ukrainians, and sometimes Germans, and Wehrmacht people, and even SS. Uh, because survival uh, <coughs> depended almost uh, entirely uh, on choices made by other people. Uh, it was extremely unlikely to survive if somebody didn't help you. Uh, it is also true that many people who Shelter Jews then betrayed them or handed them over. Uh, but those who survived uh, almost all depended on m much more than one person who hid them, who fed them, who gave them milk at some point, or gave them some, some clothes. And so when, when you look at this from the point of view of Jews, uh, you get a very different picture of the people that the Germans saw just as those who were running to be killed. There's one, one moment that I just want to touch on, which is that uh, when you get to the end of this period, uh, in the months before the Red Army arrives, and as the German uh, apparatus begins to disintegrate and the Gestapo is leaving, the, the, uh, the Red Army is too close, uh, Jews, in some cases, are saved by uh, German uh, agricultural officers, and uh, German combat officers. Uh, and who are they saving them from? Because the Gestapo is no longer there. They're saving them from local Ukrainians. Um, and we know this not from accounts by Germans, which would be questionable, obviously, but from accounts by <coughs> Jews, uh, who go to a certain town nearby, particularly one case, where there, there are two Germans, one is an agricultural officer, one is a Wehrmacht officer, who are known to be protecting their Jews and who stay there until the Soviets arrive. And so you get, a, a, again, a sense of the intimacy of this entire event on the ground, that although, obviously, most of the Germans on the ground there, uh, the security police and so forth, their charge is to kill Jews, and they do it very efficiently. And in Buchach, 10,000 Jews are murdered, which is more than the population, the Jewish population there in 1939, uh, because they bring Jews also from other places. And about half of them are buried there in mass graves. But you also understand that people were constantly making choices as to whether they can help someone or not, even just for one day. And that those who survived are those who benefited from these choices. The, the last chapter, I talk about neighbors. Uh, th these, uh, these are members of the OUN, of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Uh, for Poles and Ukrainians, Jews were very interested in Poles and Ukrainians because they really depended on them uh, or, with, or were fleeing them. Uh, but Poles and Ukrainians were mostly interested in each other uh, because what happens, particularly as the Germans finished more or less the job with the Jews, which is by summer 1943. After that, there were only small numbers of Jews remain, and Galicia has declared uh, Judenrein. Um, um, there is a civil war that starts. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army, which is uh, created in 1943, 
begin an operation of ethnically cleansing first the province of Volinia, which is north of uh, Galicia, and then they go down in late 43, early 1944 uh, into Galicia, and they start ethnically cleansing Poles. They start destroying Polish villages. Uh, the, the Poles organize also, the Polish Home Army is present there, so there's a, 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 a great deal of fighting and mutual killing. Although there's much more killing of Poles than of Ukrainians because Poles are a minority. The Germans are not in, involved in most of this. This is something that has to do with Ukrainian-Polish affairs. But the killing is on a very large scale. And this continues even after the Red Army arrives. Uh, only the relationship of forces changes because then the Poles are recruited by the Soviets to create what, what they call destruction battalions, uh, mostly made of Poles and, and surviving Jews, that go to Ukrainian villages and look for Ukrainian nationalists. Um, and tens of thousands of Ukrainians are deported into the Soviet Union. And finally, in an agreement between the Soviet Union and Communist Poland, uh, there is a so-called population exchange, and whatever is left of the Poles in that area are uh, deported to Poland. Uh, most of them want to leave at that point because uh, it is very dangerous staying there. And the Poles uh, deport large numbers of Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, uh, from Poland into that area, so that by the end, the people who live in towns such as Buchach are people who, most of them, had never been there before. Uh, and I'll stop here, so thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, this is just... Uh, uh, so this is the Jewish cemetery, and this is the Fedor Hill. The town is in the middle, and the mass killings happen on this hill and that hill, and you could hear the shooting. If you were in the middle of the town, you were within hearing distance and at times uh, seeing distance uh, of uh, both these sites. And they're still uh, sites of mass graves, and they're not marked. Um, yeah, okay, I won't. Yes? So what were the major kinds of sources, for example, from the period from, let's say, 1935 to 1945, that besides mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, uh, the, the individual stories mm -hmm. that people that you were able to interview or records that they kept, what, what, what sort of records were kept by the various mm -hmm. groups that were either affected or were uh, affecting the, the, the genocide? This huge amount of sources, so for, from 35 to 39, uh, most of the sources uh, come from Polish archives, uh, th but not only from 35, uh, starting in the 1920s. Uh, you have administrative sources, you have uh, economic uh, sources, you have uh, demographic sources, and you, and you have police files, uh, extensive police files on uh, political activities on um, opponents and so forth. So um, much of what I know about, say, the Communist Party there uh, is from Polish po police uh, uh, files. What I know about the Ukrainian nationalists there is from Polish police files. So they, they have very uh, intensive investigations. There are also uh, uh, rather interesting uh, German reports, especially from the latter, uh, just before the war, uh, the Germans had a representation in, uh, in uh, Lvov, or Lvov, uh, and they had one in Chernovitz, and they're reporting, uh, they have people who travel in the area and report on inter-ethnic uh, uh, events, and you have Soviet uh, reports as well. Uh, that's, until 40, that's until 39, between 39 and 41, uh, there, there are many Soviet uh, records for that period. Uh, from 41, to 44, uh, you have German official records. Uh, then you have a lot of records of the underground, of the Polish underground, of the Ukrainian underground. Uh, these are sort of official reports, and that's quite apart from individual accounts, uh, diaries, testimonies, uh, and so forth. Uh, yeah. What are the what do the official Ukrainian reports say about uh, who is responsible for the killing, the mass killing of Jews? Um, <laughs> the, 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 
uh, Ukrainian uh, underground, th there is a um, there is an office of their own in Ternopil, in Ternopil, and uh, they they don't have much to say about the killing of the Jews. Uh, they they're not really concerned with that. And most of what they report is about the either the fighting between the Oun and the Home Army and other, the Armia Krajowa, the, so between the Poles and the, uh, and the Ukrainians, or about German policies and their relationship to German policies, or about Soviet policies. Uh, but they're not particularly interested in uh, what's happening with the Jews. And the moment at which you have more uh, Ukrainian reports is really from 43 on. So there's also less to say about the Jews because much of this is over. Uh, and from that, their point of view, it's not particularly interesting anymore. When were the mass graves exhumed? The mass graves, okay, so um, the, the, the picture that you see is from right after the Soviets come. I, I didn't go into all of that, but the, the Red Army arrives in Buchach first in March 1944, and 800 Jews come out of hiding, which is a large number. Uh, however, uh, which tells you, it, it's, it's interesting, there are various interpretations, how come so many survive. However, two weeks later, the Wehrmacht returns. And these are SS divisions. Uh, and almost all of the Jews who came out of hiding, who obviously can't walk, they've been hiding in bunkers underground for months on end, uh, are killed. Uh, and very few managed to flee with the Red Army which, from its point of view, is only executing a tactical retreat. It returns in July, uh, and then it returns in force, and then it um, takes over the area, and then it, it uh, excavates. So the excavations, the exhumations in Buchach are done in October, November 1944. Uh, and they're, they're interesting in that uh, there's also, so they, they create a committee that investigates that. The committee initially has locals, including a number of Jews, uh, in early October. By November, when they report, it's mostly Ukrainian, and the report changes. So it's either Russians or Ukrainians, and it's all good uh, Soviets. Mm -hmm. Your mother was born in 1924, Exactly, correct? yes. What was the population of the church at that point, and how many Jews, and when you... Uh -huh. Go over the years, what's the population? Yeah. So that, um, the population changes over time, and yet more or less stays the same. So it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, there were about um, uh, 14,000 Jews on the eve of World War I. By the end of World War I, the population has been more than halved. Uh, of that population, in 1914, about half of the population are Jews. Uh, the, the height of... Um, uh, Jewish presence in Buchach is in the 1880s. In the 1880s, about uh, two-thirds of the population are Jews. But between the late 19th century and 1914, the Jewish population, their, their share in the population diminishes because many people are leaving. Right? A lot of Ukrainians are leaving to North America, to Canada and, uh, and the United States, and a lot of Jews. Uh, so the, the proportions change. Um, now, between 1921 and 1939, the population rises again. So it reaches about 15,000. And of that, uh, and it's a bit hard to tell for sure, there are about 8,000 Jews, and the rest are either Poles or Ukrainians. The reason it's hard to tell, uh, the last actual census in 19, is 1931. Uh, it looks great, it's a wonderful, a lot of um, uh, details, uh, but it's manipulated, it's, it's, a, it's a Polish census, so they, they do all the gerrymandering and all the stuff to show that they're much more Poles, far more Poles than they actually were, by including Polish villages and excluding Ukrainian villages, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. Um, but the other reason is that between 1939 and 1941, you have the Soviets there, so many people are deported, many people are conscripted into the Red Army, and then you have many refugees coming from German-occupied Poland into that area, and many of these refugees are then deported by the Soviets. And we don't have precise figures. How, how, how many are coming in, how many are conscripted, 
So it's an estimate that there were about 8,000 Jews out of about 15,000 altogether. Uh, by the end of uh, World War II, uh, the, the population, I mean, you have reports by Soviets who come to the town. They say the town was empty. There was nobody there. Uh, but many of those who were not there had fled just uh, a short distance, and then they come back. Uh, they're mostly Ukrainians and Poles. Uh, but we're talking a few thousand. I know you said you didn't want to go into a whole lot of detail during the talk, but I'm curious about... Um some of your source space uh, for, for assembling this portrait of how everyday citizens mm -hmm. participated and what was, what was happening yes. and what kind of testimonies or, or, or yeah. histories or accounts existed. So there's, uh, th th there's a multitude of sort of first person uh, accounts. Uh, if you talk about Jews, um, the majority would be um, diaries, some diaries. That's also for Poles and Ukrainians, although very few. But I have a really interesting Ukrainian diary that I want to publish separately. Uh, um, so first of all, diaries, some. Uh, then you have very early accounts. So especially for Jews, there were these that uh, were then stored in Zich in, in Warsaw and now are available here. And then over the years, more and more. And then there are memoirs as well. Uh, so that's one source. For Poles, uh, there are some diaries. There are many accounts uh, that are in the Hoover Institution, and those are mostly of Poles who were deported by the Soviets. Mm -hmm. So they give an interesting picture. Uh, that's the kind of material that uh, Jan Gross used uh, in uh, Revolution from Abroad. Uh, uh, so they, they give a very interesting picture of the Polish point of view of the Soviet occupation. Um, 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 after the war, uh, there are, um, well, I also have quite a number of interviews with uh, Poles who had lived there, uh, as well as some were Jews. Uh, and those, some are very extensive and very interesting, people who remember their childhood and youth there. Um, and there were trials. Um, so there were also Polish trials. Uh, and there's interesting information. There are also Polish uh, requests for. Um, um, compensation, not compensation, for ha help from uh, uh, Jewish organizations in Poland after the war claiming that they had saved Jews and now could they please be helped. And they tell stories about what happened and some are very moving and some uh, I'm not sure are true. Um, so it, it's, or, or that's not all that happened, let's say. Um, it, for uh, Ukrainians, uh, there are some diaries there are some interviews uh, that I did or that were done for me, um, it, um, but there's, there's less material for Ukrainians, clearly. But some is actually very, very powerful. Uh, there, there's some by a number of women who did stay in Buchach uh, and were interviewed in the 1990s and talk about their Jewish friends and about what happened there and, and very powerful accounts. Now, Apart from all that, there's a massive record of trials. And the best, of course, are the German trials. So trials from the late 50s into the 1970s are an extraordinary source of, I have thousands of pages of those. Uh, and that's where you also get all the, what I was saying about the, um, say, the uh, accounts by women who were wives of officials on the ground. Uh, who also tell a lot of the gossip and about the children and about their maid and so forth, and about experiencing these, these action and these acts here. Um, so um, if you put it all together, you, you get a massive amount of material. It's, it's, it, it was actually, I spent a, a whole lot of time just trying to somehow make it into one story. It's very hard. And, the, and, and they don't necessarily agree with each other, of course, and I didn't try to give one version, the true version. I'm interested in the fact that each group saw it very differently. I should say that each group also saw itself in 1914, in 1930, in 1939, in 44, and today as the main victims. They are all victims, and they're usually victims of their neighbors, <coughs> uh, and they've been treated unfairly at the time and subsequently by history, and uh, they want to tell their story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to 
what extent is there cohesion between official sources like trial transcripts and more unofficial things like diaries and memoirs? Um, the, um, they, they at times simply tell a different story about different things. So, um, you know, we think, for instance, of the, of the Germans as counting, right, uh, of being very organized and all that. They were doing nothing of the sort, you know. They, they, um, when, when they deport people, they have a train, they have to fill the train. So they, they don't count how, how many people are there. They, they can estimate, but, but they, they, they couldn't care less, right? Uh, so you don't have any figures. But what they describe, say, in their testimony in a trial is how that happened. And some of them eventually will say, oh, it was horrible. And um, my, my friends, not me, but friends of mine were using whips and dog whips and all that. I, I never used it, but, but they did. Um, a court did, but I didn't. Um, when, when you hear it from, from the Jewish point of view, then you get the same story, but it's experienced entirely differently, right? Um, so obviously there are moments in which you know that somebody is telling you something uh, or, or telling whoever they were t uh, telling that about uh, that is wrong in terms of the dates. Uh, so for instance, people think World War II started in 39, so they say the Germans came in 39, but they didn't, they came in 41. So they get the date wrong. Uh, to me, it doesn't really matter because I, I know when the Germans came and what I'm interested in is not when the Germans came, but how this person experienced it. Um, so it's not such a... The, the discrepancy is in the bigger picture. Uh, they did it to us. That's... Um, can you make the argument that Jews were safest under Franz Joseph and, and afterwards? Uh, so, yeah, it's, um, um, uh, you know, when, when the Austrians come in 1772, um, the Jews are not very happy at all. Uh, and they say, oh, they're anti-Semitic and they're taking away our privileges and, and all that. Uh, after 1848, uh, increasingly, uh, Jews feel um, beholden to the Kaiser, to Franz Josef, who is there forever, right, from 1848 to 1916. Um, um, so they feel, rightly from their point of view, not all of them of course, but many, uh, that uh, he ensures a certain kind of stability, that the regime uh, facilitates a kind <coughs> of stability between the groups, and it's true. Uh, it's also true, however, that the empire also makes for and facilitates the rise of nationalism. And, and Polish autonomy is, part, is what is given by Vienna. Um, but there is a kind of um, patriotism. It, it, you know, it changes, and it's, it's quite interesting to see that, that you have a generation, the, the Poles write about it too, that you have a generation of Jews whose uh, language, the language they choose is German. And by the late 19th century, they opt for Polish. Uh, and the reason is simple, because you want to go to university, you want to go to Lemberg, and now it's in Polish. Uh, so uh, Poles see it as Jews will go wh wherever the power is, right? And they, and they talk about it. You can't trust them. They'll, they'll go with whoever. Uh, Jews feel this is, you know, we, we want to adapt to whatever the situation is. Um, the Austrians originally see the Jews as those who would uh, help Germanize the area because they speak a dialect that is kind of like German and what we need to do is Germanize them. But the Jews are not terribly interested in being Germanized. Uh, these are very orthodox communities and they want to keep themselves to themselves. They are forced to take on names, family names and, and, and pay taxes that they, that they don't want to pay. Uh, and the Austrians are very disappointed that the Jews don't want to be German. Uh, so it's a bit more of a complicated story, right? But yes, by the end, they are Kaiser toy. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you said that all these groups were neighbors and knew each other. Yes. To what extent was there interaction uh, among them, and in yeah. what forms did it take at any given period? So it depends also uh, at the time. There is always interaction. Uh, they, they, they live together in small <coughs> towns. They live right next to each other, especially in the towns, but also in the villages. 
So many of the villages are mixed, mixed uh, Polish and Ukrainian, and there's a huge amount of intermarriage between Poles and Ukrainians. But the intermarriage is such that the, uh, the, the sons take the religion of the father and the daughters the religion of the mother. So the separation continues from generation to generation. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And at the end, in the war, um, there, 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 there are murders within families. Uh, so, it, it's, so they're together but apart. Um, in the towns, um, look, I mean, each group, and certainly uh, um, uh, Jews vis-a-vis -vis Poles and Ukrainians, yes. So each group has its own sort of socioeconomic niche. And people are identified with certain occupations. It's, 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 uh, it's very medieval in that sense, and it continues like that. So Jews, say, have water mills, right, or windmills. Uh, um, they, they, they make liquor, right? Uh, they have taverns. Uh, and that, although the Austrians try to do away with that, they fail. And so it stays like that. And so they are identified with certain trades, certain occupations, but they're also living next to each other. So you hear people saying from the 1920s and 30s, we went to school together, we studied together, I used to go to my friend's house, uh, she was good in math, she taught me math, uh, I ate their food, you know, the, uh, the Jews had sweet bread, I, I went to the Ukrainians and we used to sit and sing Ukrainian songs together uh, as we're peeling uh, corn. So um, they, they know each other very well, but they also know that they're different. And I think often what you hear, uh, and you have obviously more voices from the 20s and 30s because there were still people talking about it after the war, the children are much closer. As they grow up, they move into different groups and there's a greater distance. Um, but it's, it, it's intimate in the sense that everybody knows everybody else. Um, and. Um, I think that part of it, and, and that's, uh, I, I started talking about Rwanda and, uh, and Bosnia, I think that part of the, and I didn't go into these details, but part of the really gratuitous violence that you see there, really hor horrific stuff, axing people, and uh, is also partly dealing with this intimacy. There is something in this uh, intimacy that forces you to be particularly violent, much more than if you were a complete stranger. If you're a stranger, you take a gun and you shoot somebody. But um, this knowing people and having to make the leap from knowing them, from remember your relations with them, to killing them, uh, somehow includes rape and mutilation and, uh, and awful stuff. Um, so, so that's part of this dynamic. Uh, the, the Germans are much less interested in that. They, they just go and kill people. There is, of course, a, a lot of sex going on and other things. And um, uh, I should say, I, I didn't say that, so I'll just, uh, the, the, the one thing that you really see very clearly is that when you have this kind of local genocide, you don't have people just standing and looking. Uh, there are no bystanders in this. That simply disappears. Everyone is uh, engaged in it. In, to one extent or another, in one way or another, often people change their roles. They can be victims at one point, they can be perpetrators at another, then they loot some stuff, then they hide somebody, then they give them away. Um, but there, there is no, this idea of passive onlookers doesn't exist in, uh, in small places when there is a sort of daily routine of genocide. Um, so for me, this was really the most obvious finding. And, and, and this includes the Jews. Um, so the, the Jews are obviously more victimized, and the, the death rate of Jews is, is, is horrendous. But there is also a lot of uh, anger and resentment and rage against Jews who collaborated in one way or another, against Jewish policemen. Uh, there's a lot of corruption, there's uh, a lot of sex, uh, rape, and, and, and brothels, uh, uh, because bad times don't make people good. They, they, they don't tend in that direction. <coughs> yeah. um, how do you see the memory, uh, sort of the politics of memory evolving, about, both about the Holocaust 
and also the Polish-Ukrainian violence mm. in the past. I mean, in yeah. In the so past you know, I years. I wrote a, uh, a little book ten, ten years ago that dealt in uh, a little bit with that as I was doing research for this one, uh, erased, and so that was about the politics of memory in Western Ukraine. Um, <coughs> you, but since then, it's been another ten years. Uh, it's moved in both directions, I would say. It's, it's actually quite fascinating. Uh, I know Harry is uh, sort of studying that. Uh, so on the one hand, certainly in Poland, there, there has been a great deal of coming to terms with issues that had not been spoken about, uh, starting famously with Jan Gross, with neighbors, uh, um, and the great difficulty in Poland to accept that uh, Poles were not only victims, but also victimizers. Um, but as you know, there is now um, a sort of boomerang effect of that. Uh, and much that you could have said in Poland uh, 10 years ago now <coughs> has been criminalized. Um, and, and, and people, especially young historians, are under a huge amount of pressure uh, not to say things that they would have otherwise said. Uh, and they often need cover from uh, Western historians to, to help them uh, do that for them. Uh, in Ukraine, it's all been much slower. It's been very difficult to come to terms with this. Ukraine is a very complicated country. It has its own conflict of memories between East and West, between nationalists and Soviets. Um, there are some uh, fantastic young Ukrainian scholars who are trying to do that, but there are very few. And uh, often, I find that they ultimately have to make some compromises if they want to stay there and have a job. Uh, so it's very hard. And, and, and in Israel, too, it's a very complicated story. I mean, there's still, you know, uh, the sort of popular view. Uh, I used to tell people that I'm going to Ukraine. They, they tell me, especially people who came from there, they say, oh, you, you should be careful. You know, they're, they're all oitrim, they're all murderers. Uh, you know, uh, so the, 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 the stereotypes are still very powerful uh, and not only popular stereotypes, it sort of seeps into, and then you have things as we had with, uh, um, uh, with uh, Yushchenko, for instance, that uh, Yushchenko wanted Israel to recognize the Holodomor as genocide, not the world, but that Israel would recognize the mass famine in Ukraine as genocide so that we would have ours and they would have theirs. So there's this, we recognize that, but you have to recognize ours too. And of course, the whole of the world, well, it was the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were really Jews, so, you know, we're quit. Uh, so there's that too. Yeah, please. Um, the normalization of violence, the normalization of violence, the economic opportunism that resulted from that, um, the, the rise of nationalism, the anti-Semitism. Um, all these components are <coughs> active now in the world. Yeah. Uh, based on your research, um, are there any, is there any advice or, or any wisdom you can offer regarding patterns of human behavior and what seems to me to, me to be a kind of a, a, a societal sociopathy that keeps coming up in different places? I was, I'm very interested that, that you're saying knowing others and personalizing can create greater violence between parties because I always made the presumption that to know others, right. has a, there's an intimacy and you would yeah. be less likely to violate someone else. Yeah, so, so I'm interested you know, in what you think you know, about these issues. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, if I, if I had a good answer, it, w it, w it would be great, you know. Um, I'd write a little book with that answer, it would be a great bestseller. Uh, but I would say, um, one thing I would say is what any, anybody who studies genocide, any genocide would say, is that the minute you see that one group in any society is being identified as less than human, you should start worrying. Uh, whatever it is, whatever you call them, the minute you identify a group as they don't, they're not like us, they're different, they, are, they, they do these things, uh, you should worry. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing, um, 
I, I think, you know, what, what happened over there is not going to happen there again uh, because that situation is being solved, right? Uh, everything has been simplified. There are no intermixed groups anymore. Uh, it's a cold conflict. Uh, there are other areas, such as the one that I come from, uh, where the conflict is not cold at all. Uh, and where there is, um, in my view at least, uh, and that's an area that I'm interested in, uh, there is a potential of massive violence. There is a potential of ethnic cleansing. Uh, it's really there. And there is a sentiment that you know. I mean, it's basically, if, if you live in a place where the, wh people want to wake up in the morning and see that the other group is gone, and they won't ask any questions. That's what they would like to have. It doesn't happen, and it's not so easy to make it happen, but if it could, they'd be quite happy that the other group would just disappear, and they won't ask any questions where it went, and if they left some property behind, so much the better. Uh, when we see that, that I think it's incumbent on us to actually try and do something about it. So to get people close, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not against people speaking with each other and knowing each other. I'm just saying that the idea that uh, people living together side by side, the idea of tolerance, that we teach tolerance on its own, it's not enough. In nationalism, there is a potential to transform people <coughs> very quickly from neighbors who interact with each other to people who kill each other. Uh, and uh, that's something that we have to recognize. Um, and the way to act against it is to actually think about the specific event, not to generalize. Tolerance is all very nice, but what is that specific case all about, and how can we defuse that? Um, I, when I was sort of studying what was happening in, uh, in Galicia in the 1930s, I have to admit much of that uh, seemed to me sort of had echoes of what I see in the West Bank. Uh, a lot of similar dynamics of, of potential violence there. I mean, real violence too, but a potential for much more. Uh, y y you can tell it's not hard, or you can deny it. Um, and that's just one case. I mean, there are many other cases around the world. I just uh, happen to know that quite intimately, that one. Uh, but otherwise, I don't know. Uh, uh, we need to elect the right leaders, for one thing. Uh. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much.